So I'm going to start with my own random collision story, as this is the, the theme. Um, ten years ago, I was sat on a plane, and I was off to Uganda to volunteer in a baby orphanage. And I had in my hand a picture of a little boy, and his name was Jonathan, and he'd been abandoned on a rubbish tip at one day old. And I was sat on this plane going to Uganda because I wanted to go and help Jonathan. And there was this man, this Ugandan businessman, sitting next to me. And I was desperate for him to ask me, what are you doing? But of course, he was really important. So it was only when we were like traveling down and on the landing, when he asked me what I was doing, and I got my picture out of Jonathan. And I said, I'm going to this orphanage, and I'm going to go and look after this boy. And he looked at the picture, and he said, that's my son. I'm adopting him. So let's rewind 10 days later, 10 days, 10 days earlier. So let's rewind 10 days earlier. I was sat in the diary room listening to a Big Brother housemate. My job was the voice of Big Brother. And my job was to create content, to engage up to 10 million people. And one day, a celebrity walked into the Big Brother diary room. I was sat behind the booth. And for 45 minutes, he ranted about being deprived of Diet Coke. And the reason why I'd got into television was because I wanted to make the world a better place, not to listen to a man who'd been deprived of Diet Coke. And it was there and then that I decided to get on that plane with that picture of Jonathan. And I landed in Uganda. And I was volunteering in an orphanage, and I walked in and there were 50 children in their cots, begging for love and attention. I'd gone from the glamour of television and celebrities to changing on day one 100 nappies, and I swear I'd never changed a nappy before. And I genuinely felt that this was my purpose. Children were being abandoned on rubbish tips and in car parks, and I was there, and my job was to look after these children. And one little boy, he came in to the orphanage, and he was four weeks old, and he'd been abandoned in a car park. And when he was four months old, what happened was, was that he, um, he died, and he died of meningitis. And, and I realized at that very, very moment, as I was burying his body, that no one in his small, tiny life had ever loved him. And now he was gone, no one, no, one, no one had ever cared about him. And I never wanted that to happen to another child. So I decided to quit my TV career. And I thought that the best thing to do was build the best orphanage in the world. Because frankly, I'd seen children like Abraham pass away in bad orphanages. And I thought that the only option was to build a better one. So I set up a charity called Child's Eye Foundation. And what this charity was, was it was a community. And it was a community of supporters across the world who all passionately believed that children should belong in families. And we thought the solution was to build a good orphanage. And everyone thought it was a brilliant idea until I asked my friend's dad, who was an expert in child development. And I sat in front of him and I told him about how I wanted to build the best orphanage in the world. And he looked at me and he told me I was making a terrible mistake. But basically, what I didn't know, what he taught me, was about attachment. I don't know how many people in the room have children or nephews or nieces, but what happens is, is that 
When your child cries, you're there to hug them. And when they're hungry, you feed them. And what, that hap what happens is, is that you, have, you build the foundations in their brain, these secure attachments, which means that they know that whatever happens, you've got their back. But in orphanages, what you're doing is you're creating a really warped talent show where children are begging strangers like me for love. Pick me, choose me, love me. And you take a photo, you put it up on your net Instagram, and then you put the child down and you abandon them again. But I had a little problem. <laughs> Because basically, we'd persuaded a worldwide community of supporters to raise nearly 100,000 to build the best orphanage in the world. And now I'm being told that it's a terrible idea. So what we did was we needed to take people on a journey, a journey that would, people would understand what we would need to do other than build a 50-bed orphanage. So what we did was we persuaded Brian, the expert, <laughs> to get on a plane with a friend of mine who's a producer, and every single day, we filmed, and we shared our journey on Facebook. This was 10 years ago, where we were sat in, in Uganda, and we were trying to watch a timeline go up, and it took four hours to upload a two-minute video, but that two-minute video was worth it, because what happened was our supporters asked questions, and the next day, we would go and find out the answer. So on day one, we, had, we thought that the orphanage was a splendid idea, but by day 21, we realized that actually that wasn't the option, and what we needed to do was we needed to set up a transitional center to prove that we could get children out of orphanages, into families, and prove that we could close it down. But the problem in Uganda is that there are 50,000 children in orphanages. 20 years ago, there were 1,000. So what has happened is, over the last 20 years, there has been an explosion. And that has been partly down to people like me who think that building an orphanage is a solution. And after you've built the orphanage, the more children that you get, the more volunteers will come. The more children that you have in the orphanage, the more sponsorship you can have. You can invite mission trips over. And what that means is, is that it's created a business model. So when a mother who is struggling to feed her child takes the child to the orphanage, the only option is to take her child away from her rather than support her. And that is the reason why 80% of children in orphanages all have families. They're not orphans. And these families are giving up their children in the promise of a better life. But at best, these children will suffer developmental delays. But the worst is over 63% of children suffer abuse. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to prove the impossible. We wanted to prove that instead of orphanages, we could place children into families. But to do that, we needed to invest in a social work team. And I called my social work team CSI Kampala, because as soon as a child was abandoned, they were there at the scene gathering evidence. And this is Africa. It takes a community to raise a child. And in 60% of the cases, we found the families of these children. Like Samuel and his grandmother, he was abandoned in a petrol station. But we tracked down his grandmother, and when we called her, it called her and we said, we have your grandson, she dropped the phone, and she ran to our center and picked up her grandson, and he was, she was like, he is mine. Now, what we also needed to do was we needed to prove and we needed to encourage national adoption because there were families that we couldn't find and we needed to find permanent families. 
And what we did was, this was George and Desire, who were our first adoptive family. They came forward and they adopted baby Joey. And what happened was, was that using TV skills, what we did was we put George and Desire on every medium. You'd walk to work and they were on the radio. You'd go home, they were on the TV. You'd, you'd drive to work and they were on billboards. You'd go to church, there they were. We created the illusion that there were lots of people adopting. <laughs> and as a result, we now have a waiting list of Ugandans who want to adopt. Now, we had a center. But the idea was that we would always do ourselves out of business. We wanted to prove that we could get children into families so we'd be no longer needed. But there were still children who were being abandoned, and we needed a safe place for them to stay. So what we did was we persuaded our carers who worked in the center to look after the children in their own homes. And one day, I went to see Harriet and her and her kids, her foster kids. And these kids were just so happy. They had the most incredible attachment to Harriet. And they were running around in the community, and they, they belonged. And then I went back to our center, which was the best center. We were scoring 96%. And what we realized was that there is no such thing as a good orphanage. And we closed our orphanage down. But one of the greatest lessons in the time was that we spent two years working with over 150 orphanages because we thought that if we could build social work capacity, we could get children back into their families, which we did. But the unintended consequences was that we were creating empty beds. And these empty beds were sucking these children back into the orphanage. It was a revolving door. We weren't making any systemic change. So what we realized is that the only option was to close them. So over the next five years, our vision is that we would like children to grow up in families. And what we need to do is we need to prove that children can belong in families and not orphanages. So the existence of orphanages is an indicator that the state has no child protection system. So if there is a family that is struggling, the default option is to place the child in an orphanage. So what we need to do is we need to work with governments to build systems, to build child protection systems. And what we are doing is working to rebuild families, to strengthen families, to give them the, the skills so they can keep their children. We're also rebuilding social work, social workers, a professional social workforce who can ensure that the children in families are safe. And finally, we need to rebuild alternative families, foster families like Harriet, to place children in family-based settings until we find them a permanent home. But what we also need to do is repurpose, because we have orphanages, and these orphanages are infrastructure. These orphanages can transform and repurpose from an institutional care to a service that can support children in families. And we're working with some incredible people like Pastor Ruth, who set up her own orphanage for 65 children. And now she's working with us, and we're slowly transitioning the children back into families. And we're going to be using her building as a community hub. And this community hub will support up to 2,000 children and families in her community. But what we also need to do is we need to reimagine. I don't know in this room if there have been people or if there are people who thought at the beginning of my talk that orphanages were a good thing, or have supported them, or have volunteered in them. But what we need to do is we need to reimagine. We need donors to reimagine. We need governments to reimagine. We need families to reimagine. And from a financial perspective, not only are families better for children, but they are much more cost-effective. To keep 
100 children in an orphanage for 15 years. You're talking about 1.5 million. But that same investment can support up to 10,000 children in families. So families are the answer. And this is one family I would like to share with you. Her name is Grace. And I met Grace, um, and Grace, when she was pregnant with triplets, her husband, he lost his job. And she watched her little boys waste away. And she went to the hospital, and at the hospital, her, the social worker referred her on to our organization, and how social workers worked with her and helped her with an emergency grant and also supported her to set up her own business. And I asked her what would have happened if we hadn't have been around. And she told me I would have had to put my boys in an orphanage. And no one should ever have to make that decision. So, to finish up, I'd just like to share my uh, three lessons <laughs> that we've learned over the last 10 years. Um, I think we've talked a lot about collaboration, and um, we cannot do this alone. This is the most complex work in the world, and our tribe is a, a tribe called Transform Alliance Africa, and we're an organization um, who has the shared vision, and together, the organizations across Africa, we're going to realize an Africa free of institutions where every child grows up in a loving family. But everyone here in the room can help us. First of all, you can help by not volunteering, because by volunteering, you're, you are the unintended consequences, are you're creating more orphans. And secondly, you Please don't invest in orphanages, but please invest in support services to keep children in their families. And if you are supporting orphanages, help them transition. Help them transition into a service that can support children and families. And finally, and most importantly, I'd say listen to children. <laughs> uh, another theme. Because if you actually ask children what they want, they don't want shiny buildings. What they want is love, and they want to belong. And, and I believe we can realize a day where orphanages are consigned to the history books, and I want to just thank you for listening.